It is a great honor to welcome Jeffrey Tucker on this program. He is the founder and president of the Brownstone Institute. And in this hour, we are discussing the great Austrian economist and philosopher uh, Ludwig von Mises. Jeffrey, how are you? Uh, good. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, and thank you for joining the show. Um, I should like to begin by asking you about, about the Brownstone Institute. What is it and what's its mission? It was founded right after the COVID lockdowns because uh, I, I, I couldn't believe just how many people went along with it and didn't understand the implications of uh, global impositions of uh, stay home orders and uh, business closures and public meeting restrictions and all the things that went along with the lockdowns it seemed to me that it was something of a catastrophe for human liberty and and economics and yet so many people just kind of went along with it and didn't understand what the consequences would be economic financial um, uh, in terms of health and medicine and everything else and i wanted an institute to focus entirely on what I was certain was going to be a a, 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 a real crisis for civilization that uh, that would continue on for many, many years, if not a generation or two. And that seems to be happening. So we're fully engaged in understanding that from an intellectual point of view. <laughs> so do you believe that um, a couple of years since uh, the end of the lockdown, have people understood uh, clearer think, well, I don't know. You know, sometimes, uh, so p part of what I try to do all the time and what we try to do is connect, uh, connect the dots or to make the causal connections between the continuing demographic, health, economic, financial crisis around the world today and the uh, trade shifts and all the upheaval we're seeing and and the decisions made back in March 2020 try to connect the dots. And I, I think it's maybe too easy for people just to uh, look at uh, trends and isolations from 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 other trends, uh, not understand the the linkage and the causal element. But uh, so that's part of what we do is try to draw attention to that. And that, that was my concern because I knew that we would face a real estate crisis and a financial crisis and a health crisis and uh, 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 collapsing lifespans and uh, births. And I knew all this was was going to happen, um, inflation. I knew all this was going to happen back in March 2020. Um, so I kept worrying about it. But the, the danger is that it's taken you know more than four years to fully unfold, and it's going to keep going on for, for years to come. But that the longer we get away from the causal element, the less people are able to make the connection. Uh, so that's part of what I do. And I think maybe um, more people understand it than would have understand it were it not for our work. But I also am very concerned that people uh, don't want to talk about it. They just look at the migrant crisis or the rising crime or the ill health, uh, just look at the way the world has changed so dramatically and forget uh, the, the, its, its relationship to the pandemic response. Um, I think that's just too easy for people to do. And and in American politics, um, it's it's a serious problem because the lockdowns began under a Republican administration and then were continued and intensified under a Democrat administration. So that means that both parties, uh, you know, are glad to agree not to talk about it <laughs> because they're both at fault. So if you get both parties uh, at fault for something, they both agree not to talk about it. So that leaves it that leaves it to us to talk about. Yeah. So uh, has something similar to the COVID lockdown happened in the times of uh, von Mises? No. The he lived through. So he lived through two uh, world wars. I mean, the Great War and then World War II, um, and you had a different. Uh, he, he did face in enormous crises during his life for sure. Um, the Great War uh, he had experienced as a as a as a young man as a soldier. Um, he had just written his uh, in nineteen twelve his first great book on. On on monetary theory, called theory of money and credit, and it was it was a huge hit throughout Europe and and quite a wonderful 
uh, book. It still is very good, actually, after a hundred and whatever it is, 12 years. It's still a wonderful book. But um, he, uh, but then he, he went off to war. And it was interesting because he, when he wrote his theory of money and credit, uh, he wasn't particularly, I would say, not a particularly polit political person. I mean, I mean, he sort of came out of that old world, maybe an old world sort of liberal outlook a little bit, but, you know, not entirely exercised about the dangers of government planning uh, or socialism, anything like that. But but being at war, the Great War, he saw the way uh, governments work, and he saw that the cause of the war was just um, dip diplomats just uh, sort of making huge errors and playing um, games with the lives of multitudes of people uh, all over the world. And it really sickened him and it changed him really. So, so when he came back after the war, he was a bit of a, he was kind of a different person. He was more committed than ever to uh, what was then called liberalism, which meant you know, um, free markets and and limited limit, limited government and sound money and these kinds of principles. And he wrote a book in 1919 called Nation, State, and Economy. That was really a, a, just a tremendous book. I mean, it's too bad it wasn't more influential. It came out the same year as uh, John Maynard Keynes's Economic Consequences of the Peace, which is actually an interesting book. Both books were against the Versailles Treaty, uh, which is the the treaty that imposed really punishing uh, financial terms on on Germany. Uh, what the victorious allies did is they forced the resignation of the Kaiser Wilhelm the Wilhelm the Second, and ended uh, a three hundred year reign of the Prussian monarch, and imposed on the post-war post -war Germany for this very first time a kind of representative democracy. And uh, and along with that, very harsh uh, financial terms that they, uh, all the allies, Great Britain and the U.S., demanded payment from Germany in the form of um, uh, gold and uh, gold back uh, German marks, uh, hard money they they demanded. And and both Mises and Keynes were completely against this. Um, and they they also had to both books. Well, Mises is more than Keynes, but especially Mises was trying to grapple with uh, the problem of what do you do in a post-war period where you had these multi multinational monarchies sort of ruling large territories, uh, polyglot territories, meaning that people spoke different languages, there were different peoples, different religions and heritage. Um, they all lived more or less peacefully. Um, for uh, in the previous period before the war, um, and the 1870s, 1890s, uh, 80s, not everything was perfect, but the monarchies seemed to kind of more or less keep the peace. But they were all gone now, and we're entering into the age of democracy. And Mises uh, really had, had grappled with this really cr critical question, which was, how do we know uh, where the the new? What are, how do we know what the new? borders of the nations are going to be what constitutes a nation how do you become a nation how do you earn the right to become a nation uh, how big or how small should they be and 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 how do we know now uh the allies uh in that case Woodrow Wilson was the, was the president uh didn't know anything about European history it didn't know anything about really much of anything <laughs> unfortunately and uh, you know, was put in a position of basically carving up Europe into into new into new borders and new nation states. And if he had listened to Mises, he would have done a much better job. Mises is a rough approximation for what constitution uh, constitutes a, a a viable nation, independent nation, is uh, people on a single territory who uh, spoke the same uh, language um, as the first language. And which is a decent proxy, especially in the European context, for what might have worked out, you know, in a much more peaceful situation. Unfortunately, um, Mises's book was was uh, was pretty well ignored. Um, there's a lot more in the book. He has a strong. That's why he issued his strongest criticisms to date of socialism as an economic system, because. Uh, one of the consequences of the Great War was the Bolshevik Revolution in in uh, Russia, the 
there again, the, 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 the old monarchy was overthrown, the czar was overthrown and replaced by uh, this group of uh, fanatics who had a new system they thought they were going to fix the world through um, what they called socialism. And um, Mises spelled out all these reasons in 1919 why this is a terrible idea that that socialism actually makes absolutely no sense. You can't have collective ownership of, of, of property and still retain the ability to have a functioning economy. And so, so that was, that was already in, uh, in 1919, he, he spelled this out. He went a little further in, in 1921 uh, and then in 23 to elaborate on that point and really drove it home. His great book, 1923 book called Socialism, um, still, I is it my favorite of all of his books? Maybe, but um, yeah, it's a mighty book. I mean, you asked about Mises and whether he had experienced crises. So let me just keep going with this. In 1923, um, we saw the consequences of the Versailles Treaty take place in Germany. So um, in order to pay its war debts, Germany inflated its currency, uh, uh, just buying, uh, creating more marks. Uh, well, they, they were they were buying hard hard currency and gold with uh, newly printed paper money, uh, just to pay its war debts, and that created a, a, a destructive inflation that really uh, wrecked uh, what was left of Germany. It was already a society that was in upheaval, dealing with a new government, a new democratically elected government called the Weimar Republic. But all the old elites were gone, so. Um, it was a huge disaster. The currency was literally destroyed uh, to the point that by 1923, uh, all the currency was being used as heating fuel in people's homes rather than actually working as a functioning currency. And uh, so that was a catastrophe, and that led directly to the to the rise of the strongman savior in the form of of Hitler several years later, and 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 that again led to. To World War II. So Mises watched all of this unfold. A very uh, sad life, a very tragic life. So yeah, the COVID lockdowns were terrible times, um, but arguably uh, what Germany faced, you know, after the Great War and then from 1921, 22, and 23 was 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 even more destructive and more terrible. I see. Yeah, I was thinking more in the lines of the Spanish flu as opposed to 1918. Yeah. Well, so yeah, maybe that's right. So, um, uh, what's funny about the Spanish flu is that uh, we know now, looking back at it, that um, it was it was quite deadly. Um, but but most of the people who were alive for the Spanish flu had not most of the people alive, but there were older people who remembered what it was like to live in the middle of pan a pandemics. So it wasn't particularly unusual. Uh, the big, the most of the death from the Spanish flu came not from the Spanish flu as such, but from the secondary infections. Um, like uh, they didn't have antibiotics during that, uh, but there were never any lockdowns. Uh, there were um, some cancer, and I know about. I'm not sure about the European case. And by the way, it's fascinating you mention this because Mises nowhere mentions the Spanish flu in any of his works, <laughs> and and most people didn't. You know, it just wasn't. Maybe it was a European thing. It wasn't that big. Uh, but even in the U.S., um, we didn't have all the data that we have today. We didn't have news media functioning like we did today. So for a lot of people, it just came and went. It was no big deal. Um, in some cities, we had uh, at Chicago and in San Francisco, some business closures and then mask mandates, um, out of which, from which we under, came to understand that masks don't really work but the, but the, but New York never did anything about it my life for the most part went on as normal so there there were some um mild I say you know business closures but there were never domestic capacity restrictions or stay home orders or anything like that and it was only in as far as I know it was only in two cities in the United States <laughs> yeah so uh you mentioned uh Keynes so how did um, John Maynard Keynes and his book, um, The General Theory, uh, become the more popular book in his uh, economic philosophy, the more popular philosophy than that of Mises? Uh, right. Um, well, so after this disaster in Germany, 
uh, we saw the rise of, of of fascism in many places in Europe. Something very similar happened in in Italy with the rise of Mussolini, and and in Spain, um, and uh, there was a wide widespread view coming out of the you're going into and coming out of the Great Depression that 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 liberalism and capitalism had failed as a system, uh, and so the only alternative out there was, uh, you know the socialism that was being pushed by the Bolsheviks. And so what the world really needed was some kind of, was there a third system that we could we could imp implement that was neither capitalism nor socialism? Maybe we could experiment with that. And and Keynes stepped up. He was an English uh, aristocrat, uh, very highly regarded. He had made a reputation for himself from his 1919 book. And he put together a uh, a, a new theory of economics to back what was essentially a, a corporativist a state with a tremendous amount of power for government to uh, spend money and print money to uh, even out business cycles. And um, I, I suppose, and, and his book, uh, The General Theory, came out as a kind of uh, justification for what governments were already doing anyway in Germany, Italy, Spain, the United States, and the UK um, after the Great Depression hit. So he seemed to add a kind of a scientific defense of what was already going on. Uh, and and his, his economic theories uh, uh, were completely, um, in a sense, completely new. I mean, they, they overthrew all classical economics and, and all the prevailing views at the time. And um, it was kind of exciting for a whole generation of people. So they just rallied around him. And a lot of, I think a lot of the reason why Keynes was so popular was uh, he, he said what governments wanted to hear, no question about it. Um, and uh, uh, there was a widespread perception that, that capitalism had failed and nobody wanted Bolshevik style socialism. So he seemed to offer uh, an alternative to that. The other thing is that um, he was personally very uh, compelling. He, he was he was just he he was charming. He was aristocratic. He was tall. He was handsome, and he knew all the right people. And um, people just absolutely loved him. I mean, just as as a person, he was he was extremely persuasive. I mean, his influence just immediately as a general theory came out, it, he just became you know the number one economist and and. And in London, and then became very popular in the U.S. too. And his influence lasted and lasted all the way through uh, World War II. And then, coming out of World War II, Keynes was the major influence over all the post-war uh, monetary reconstruction uh, schemes. You know, from the World Bank to the International Monetary Fund to uh, the general agreement on tariffs and trade, and then um, and then especially the new monetary arrangement called uh, the Britain Woods uh, Dollar uh, ex Exchange Standard. So Keynes's influence was 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 just immense, and Mises could could never really compete with it. <laughs> yes, uh, of course, uh, Mises uh, believed that this uh, middle of the road approach, so a third yeah. way. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from capitalism, capitalism and socialism would lead mm -hmm. to socialism. Um, I think he wrote a short book that with that title, "The Middle of the Road Leads yeah. to Socialism." So yeah, uh, it's why because, did he believe yeah, that? he didn't think it would work. So he he figured that you know what would happen is that they would implement these policies that whether it's inflationary economics or price controls or nationalization of industry, and he explained why all that stuff would work would not actually accomplish its stated goals. And and that the 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 the, the policy would, you you would typically expect from a failed policy, what you'd like is to see the policy unraveled and liberalism come about. But instead, he said, what usually happens is a patchwork of ever more coercive policies and compulsion, and and so that fascism, uh, the mixed economy would become fascism. Fascism would gradually turn into full scale. Socialism. So um, he thought uh, the third way was was uh, incredibly unstable, and I think that history has borne that out. I mean, most countries have some kind of mixed 
system today and uh, and it's it's been when we've seen ever more financial volatility um ever more increases in in um, wealth inequalities ever more financialization and and, and kind of a constant state of crisis and this has been going on for the better part of a, a century so i think he's i think he was right about that <laughs> and what would um how would mises explain the cause and nature of the great depression well his view was um that that it came that the initial correction in 1929 and following uh, was a consequence of excess money and credit creation um, following the Great War. So, and that's really true that every government in the world, you know, it had to dramatically expanded credit, and that had created uh, artificial booms, especially in financials, uh, both in the U.S. and and Europe. And the banking industry got too large, and the uh, financials uh, got ever larger and larger and larger. And those needed to correct downwards, uh, but. And and I, th I think it was Mises' view, view that if we had just allowed the correction to happen and then go back to sound money, uh, w we would have been out of the Great Depression in some period of time, maybe a year or two. But instead of that, uh, governments just kept doing ever more. In the U.S., we had the New Deal, which fixed prices. And uh, the, the, it's, it's funny because governments didn't want to allow um, deflation to happen. And the deflation happened anyway, but they didn't like it. They kept trying to reflate. So um, in Mises' view, the Great Depression was, was maybe it wasn't caused. It was caused by excess money creation before, but then it was prolonged and deepened by the very attempts to, to fix uh, the problem. And, the, you know, he was screaming about this stuff from uh, 1934, 35, 36, all the way through, he was co-authoring, um, working with um, the economist F. A. Hayek um, to 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 um, uh, to address uh, uh, these problems and and fix these problems. But um, at the same time, um, you know, Europe is dealing with its own political crisis uh, soon after the onset of the of the great depression and so the the rise of the nazis uh, really uh, pretty much wrecked um, vienna of his uh, of, of his youth and and his intellectual circle so um, mises and had to, as a as, as a jew and a liberal uh, and an intellectual uh, could not really be safe in vienna hayek had left I went to London for a sanctuary, and Mises went to Geneva for a sanctuary, where he stayed uh, between 1934 all the way up to 1940, where he finally got an opportunity to uh, migrate to the U.S. So um, did Mises remain a liberal throughout his life, and how would he... Uh, I would say so... Um, the only thing I, I would say, yes, absolutely. He was very consistent um, throughout his entire life and his messaging, which was that the world needs freedom and sound money and limited government. Um, so the only thing I would say is that there was a, I, I, was, I would think, a bit of a, a change in his in, in tone variously throughout his life. So in uh, coming out of the Great War, he was friendlier to the idea of nationalism, that the nationalism would create a kind of a unitary uh, people that would uh, demand independence and freedom. Mm -hmm. um, after watching the rise of the Nazis and seeing how nationalism became imperialistic, he he turned against that idea. And really, his his wonderful 1944 book called, called Omnipotent Government it was raging against racialism and national nationalism and and Nazism. Uh, I would say probably the most anti-Nazi book. Uh, of, of its time, of this 1944. It was, it's a remarkable book. And um, so that, I would say there's a slight change in his views. On, I, th I think I think the rise of Hitler uh, really had this profound effect on him. And then soon after that, um, he had 
he had already come to the United States in 1940 and had taken refuge um, in New York City, uh, where he had a, a small teaching post at um, at uh, at uh, New York University. Uh, that was funded by private business, by the way, not not by the university itself. Um, but after the war, in um, in uh, after the world after the world war, it's, uh, the 1940, 40, 46, 47, 48, and 48, suddenly the U.S. embarked on uh, a, a kind of a new war with its former allies in World War II, <clears throat> namely Russia. <clears throat> suddenly, the U.S. turned around and said, oh, it turns out Russia is the, is the new problem, and they're expansionist, and they're a danger, and they're spreading communism. So, um, I think I think me and me out of me, Mises had known a lot about socialism and communism from the European experience, and being an American now, he uh, he kind of joined in this in this effort. He 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 became um, he didn't write about it a lot, but he was definitely a, a cold warrior um, in the sense that he favored. Uh, U.S. intervention to roll back communism in Russia and all of its client states. And I think part of the reason for that was that he was watching from Europe, from Geneva, watching uh, the advance of Hitler, um, uh, you know, Poland, and then all the neighboring states, and saw, saw how it, it just got worse and worse and worse. And the U.S. waited a very long time to enter into the war, a very long time. And, and even then, they entered it um, under the idea of 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 waging war against you know of all things you know Japan, uh, who um, you know that's that's why the U.S. entered the war was not to beat the Nazis but to, to, to defeat the, the the emperor of Japan. I mean, it's incredible as that seems like, and most Americans don't even know that today. Um, so Mises was a little bit he was unhappy that it took uh, the U.S. so long. To recognize what an enemy Hitler was, so when the Russians had taken over Eastern Europe and then gobbled up all these clients, all these states, uh, surrounding states, and 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 uh, seemed to be expanding their reach and influence into Greece and other places in Europe, and then eventually Latin America, uh, Mises's view was that the U.S. should should do something about it. So he became a bit of a cold warrior, and then even. Um, um, I think it was really a bit of a, for a lot of Americans, the world became a very distorted place. But his 19, his brilliant, brilliant 1949 book, which is a rewrite of his 1940 book called Nazi and All Economy in 1949, came out with a large book called Human Action. Uh, by the time the third edition came out in 1966, he had changed some parts of the book. And one of the big changes he made was that he said that it was okay to have conscription um, in wartime because sometimes uh, you had to conscript citizens into war uh, for purposes of national survival. Th this was definitely not his view uh, 15 years earlier. So that was something he changed his mind on. And I think that's really a regrettable change. So that was a really, I would say, illiberal policy he endorsed in 1966 was mostly because it was in that period we were in the heart of the Cold War. I mean, the Vietnam War was coming online. To be an American in those days was just to be every minute flooded with fear of of, uh, of Bolshevism and communism and, and Russia. So he went along with a little bit of that, probably more than he should have. So to the extent that Mises was um, a well-versed reader of Marx and Marxism, what mm -hmm. does he, Mises, believe uh, that Marx misunderstands about the nature and relationship of capital and labor? Um, well, Mises was a student of Eugen von Bambarwerk, uh, who was the great economist who had first really taken on Marx's capital theory. Uh, Marx's capital view, uh, theory is that capitalists always earn a rent and return at the expense of of labor. And and he tried to demonstrate this, and, and Bambarvik um, proved that he was wrong about that, that his views on, on capitalism as inherently exploitative was, was not correct, that Marx did not understand the structure of production and didn't, didn't get um, 
competitive marks and markets and how they work. So Mises ex accepted that. But, um, um, and, and by the way, uh, uh, but, and then, uh, then you had the problem, the basic problem, which was that Marx was a socialist and Mises always thought that socialism failed because it, it didn't have uh, market prices in capital goods. And if you don't have market prices in capital goods, uh, you can't have uh, accounting, like genuine economic accounting to determine profits and losses. And if you don't have profits and losses, you can't figure out the the, the best use of resources. So he, he said that any system that gets rid of capital markets will always collapse into uh, chaos and randomness and and poverty. That's what he said. So his first problem with Marx was that he was the socialist, right? I mean, that's, so there's that. Uh, the other thing is that Marx was a weird guy. Um, he, he was not... The only difference between Marx and the socialists that preceded him is that Marx claimed to be scientific. Uh, and he denounced all the other socialists as being dreamy-headed utopians. And whereas he was uh, a, a, a materialist and a determinist and um, and had glommed on to the 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 labor theory of value of of David Ricardo who had in the 19th century had some made some mistakes and so Marx picked those up and kind of elaborated about, upon them but more than anything else what Marx did was used uh, the thought of George Friedrich Hegel he was a philosopher that long predated um, uh, Marx, but he was still very popular in all German economic circles. I mean, throughout the whole continent. I mean, Hegel was this kind of reigning uh, philosopher king, you know. And so Hegel, and so Marx just said uh, his theory, uh, he incorporated Hegel into socialistic theory. And that was that was his great innovation. And that a great incorporation consisted of nothing, really not any more than just to say, um, uh, it's inevitable that the world will turn to socialism. That's the sort of law of history that we, we go through these stages. Uh, so we had you know, um, f feudalism and capitalism, and then that would lead to socialism according to some sort of Hegelian law. So if you read Mises' 1956 book called the Theory and History, which is just another amazing book, um, he really takes apart Hegel in, in several chapters. So he goes after Marx, but he goes after Hegel um, and says that uh, essentially Hegel was wrong, that there's some sort of meta narrative to history that's determined by some some impersonal forces that Mises' view is that history is always determined by by ideas and human actions and choices. Um, I'm reading Mises' uh, great short book, The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, it's a work of wonderful prose. Is it? You know, I, I haven't, I keep meaning to reread that. I, re, I remember it uh, pretty well. What he's what he's trying to do, I, I, I keep wanting to reread it actually because I, I forget parts of it. But what he's trying to do is understand the, you know, what is it that gives rise to the hatred of of capitalism among the among average people, but then uh, mostly among the intellectuals. And he has a number of factors that he lays out. There's resentment. The intellectuals will resent the capitalists for being rich, and that whereas they're poor, and so they think the system has to be overthrown. And um, and but he also talks about uh, the aristocracy, like why did the uh, the aristocracy hate capitalism? And he says that as the generations go on, and if people living on inherited money uh, lose a, a tactile and real world connection to where it came from and and how it was made. And and see the problem of economics is more uh, not uh, not production but just distribution, and um, and so and so they turn to systems that are all about redistributing wealth rather than creating wealth. So that's another one of his uh, theories. Uh, that that particular insight was elaborated upon by uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who is another economist of Mises's generation. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think that they were friends, but they were the same, they came out of the same traditional thought and they were the same age. In fact, they taught in the U.S. together. <laughs>
Interesting. I wonder if they ever had much connection. I'm not sure. But I love um, Joseph Schumpeter's book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, where he explains this even at, at even greater length. <laughs> yes. Um, what I find interesting in uh, Mises' book is that um, the anti-capitalistic mentality is shared in the, the classes of people that um, existed before the rise of capitalism, and they, they resented its emergence because they capitalists basically dethroned them um they are you know the monarchy the aristocracy and the church uh he lists mm -hmm. those three and also the the classes of people that were created because of capitalism namely mm -hmm. intellectuals and artists uh, mm -hmm. and the like um yeah so what do all of these classes have in common in relation to their distaste of uh, this new economic system um yeah well i think oh and Mises, I think, goes into this a little bit, but when you have entrenched elites who th who imagine that they're supposed to be the leaders in society, the planners, the deciders, the decision makers, the top of the heap, you know, like uh, uh, the aristocracy uh, or the intellectuals, uh, capitalism th uh, threatens that because it it makes it makes average people rich, and and. And, and and imposes a sort of I guess what you would call like a merit, meritocratic system. So so anybody can come up with a good idea and sell a product and become rich and become richer and more popular and more influential than an intellectual or an aristocrat. So <laughs> they don't particularly like that system. There's always a tendency in and and all of all places and all times to develop hierarchies of of um, status. And and capitalism endangers that by constantly uh, churning the social classes and making the poor rich and the rich poor. And a lot of people don't like that. They, they prefer a system where you know the, it's more stable, you know, where you have the ruling class and then the working class, the merchant class, the, you know, and so on. So um, that I mean that speaks to a larger issue that I think Mises addresses in that book. Um, which is uh, that freedom has a, a tough time selling itself to elite intellectuals. So a lot of people just simply don't like the idea of letting people uh, be free. They don't like it. <laughs> yes. Um, Mises also mentioned that um, though the socialists who are most hostile to Christianity and also some Christian theologians share in the... Mm -hmm reservations and even hostility towards capitalism uh, i think of the theologian camp he mentions um Niebuhr yeah. and um tillich um yeah so yeah. as someone who is um, a catholic although a very new one um i've only converted in uh 2022 um how can one be um you know a, a believer of uh christian teaching especially catholic social teaching and also be a supporter of the free market. Well, that's you know, it's a big question. I, I, there's Catholic social teaching has its good moments and its bad moments. It's it's clear moments and that it's and it's vague moments. I mean, it was strongly against socialism and for the rights of uh, workers, which is is good. I mean, the right of people to earn their living was something that the COVID lockdown just completely shattered. Um, but the, the church has, has uh, always been a. But the important thing to remember um, is that the church is a, an institution that's that's in charge of theology and morals and doctrine. It's not there to lay out a, 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 an economic system or a plan. That's not its job. It's not its purpose. Uh, so anytime the the church is speaking on on matters of economic theory it's really outside of its its realm of expertise you know and and certainly that doesn't and and no catholic is obligated to believe anything that you know the pope says about economics it was just you know he can talk all he wants about economics but it's not somehow binding on anybody uh, and christians have been you know christianity's been around a long time two thousand years basically and um and christians have been all over the map <clears throat> um in terms of their politics, you know, you've got um, the uh, Russian anarchists, um, 
uh, American anarchists were themselves uh, associated with Christianity, Eastern, Eastern Orthodoxy. <laughs> you have um, strong tr strains of Anabaptism um, coming out of Germany and and other places in Europe, in the United States, where they established huge communities uh, of Mennonites and Amish and these other kinds of uh, uh, sects of Christianity that didn't believe in progress at all. You know, I mean, like in the United States, we have whole millions of, of people who adhere to these Mennonite and Amish faith who still will not drive in a car, you know. <laughs> They're still driving around in carriages because I think uh, modernity is corrupt. So Christianity has been all over the place in terms of economics, I guess. Um, you know, the main the main job of anybody who, who who proclaims to be a profession Christian is to is to learn uh, economics the same as anybody else, you know, and and remember that the fundamental postulates of of uh, Christian moral teacher are not that different from most religions, which is um, looks down on violence and ill treatment of your neighbor um, and recognizes the legitimacy of things like property rights and um, and says that killing is a sin, you know? So all this stuff is fully compatible with uh, Mises' liberalism. Uh, Mises was really upset with the Christians of his time because a lot of them in, in Austria were socialists, and he couldn't he couldn't square that with the teaching of um, Christianity. Although he thought the Christian Christian teaching was itself a little bit ambiguous on this topic, so uh, he was not a, a, a big fan of Christianity. A major reason he wasn't a fan, at least back in the twenties and thirties, was because most of the Christians in Europe at that time were friendly uh, to the socialists because they thought you know socialism would be good for the poor, or some superficial reason like that. Uh, he later became a little friendlier to Christian Christianity once he came to the U.S. and encountered in the 1950s and 60s um, a lot of Christians in the U.S. that didn't like socialism, didn't like communism, and 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 even wrote for publications uh, with with a Christian uh, mission and wrote for them and and i would say got warmer and warmer towards christianity as as his life went on <laughs> yeah um i know that um you know uh pope leo the 13th uh you know he he wrote that sick encyclical uh, rerum novarum that that was a sort of a socio-economic treatise and of course um mm -hmm. saint john paul ii he was also against socialism mm -hmm. and um you know um, I, I suppose there are writers like chesterton and um Belloc, they they came up with a, a different um, economic system, distributism. Yeah, yeah, I think there's something to say for distributivism. It's it's fine. I mean, um, I think Chester and Belloc are pretty good, um, pretty insightful. But you know, it's important to remember these guys weren't economists. You know that mm -hmm. that they they uh, they wanted a wide distribution of property and and sort of prosperity for all, and that's a decent thing. I think market arrangements are the best. And the other thing is that you remember they were English Englishmen, so um, they were dealing with, uh, on one hand, to their left, the the laborers laborers uh, movement, which was pro socialist, and then to the right, the Tories, <clears throat> which was uh, always defending uh, large landowners and uh, uh, the the aristocracy and and their ill gotten gains, <laughs> you know. Uh, over the centuries, and uh, B Belloc and Chesterton took uh, a middle position, I, uh, which they called distributism. <laughs> and I understand where it comes from; it makes sense to me. But they didn't like large-scale, you know, business, corporate business, and large landowners and that sort of thing. Uh, which, by the way, I don't, I don't like them either. I mean, they gave us the COVID lockdowns, so. <laughs> There, there might be some uh, more truth in, in Chesterton and Belloc than I think we recognize that. You know, a lot of what I've done since since the end of COVID is go back and revisit some of these old works and say, did they anticipate what had happened here? I mean, the COVID lockdowns were very much a ruling class imposition. You know, it was like a, like a Tory um, uh, policy. You know, uh, big tech, big media, big pharma, working with big government, large corporations to exploit the whole population. 
and make themselves rich. That's essentially what happened. So um, I think Belloc and Chesterton's warnings against concentration of wealth uh, might actually be quite uh, prescient in, in light of the lockdowns. I need to revisit it and, and read it and see. Mm -hmm. So visiting the beginning of our conversation, um, so why do you believe that so many people who are not part of big tech, big pharma, big government, uh, et cetera, go along with it? Um, well, I think it was it was a lot of fear. Uh, people have a natural sort of fear of infectious disease. You're talking about the COVID lockdowns in particular? Yes. Yeah. Um, people have a natural fear of, of of disease and death. And they and they, they wrongly think that disease and death is something that's always external to them, like that that there's a bug out there. It's not really true. Uh, you know, the reason we die young or, uh, well, of course, we die because we die. I mean, we're going to go the way of all flesh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? I mean, all, everybody's going to die. People would like to prolong that point of death uh, uh, as, you know, push it far into the future. And they think that the way to do that is by avoiding um, dangerous pathogens that'll come and invade their bodies. So forgetting that the main reason you die is because of internal reasons. I mean, ill health and that sort of thing. I mean, ill health is a much greater danger than SARS-CoV-2. But when all the governments in the world and all the media started screaming, oh, you got to stay away from the virus, got to stay away from the virus, it's going to kill you, people had to believe it because they never heard anything like that before. And and people are ill-educated about about viruses and sickness and health in general. And they just, they, belie they believed and they went along with it. So it was a fear campaign that was actually incredibly effect effective. The other thing is that, um, you know, by 2020, in most parts of the world, um, society become ever more secular. So people didn't really have a kind of um, root sense of meaning and philosophy uh, to, to guard them against liars and myth tellers and propagandists. They were very vulnerable and looking for some path to meaning. And I think the COVID lockdowns kind of gave them uh, what I'll, gave a lot of people what they're looking for, which was some sort of purpose in life, a job to do, a ritual to follow. And and people sort of long to do that. They don't like to live in this, you know, just a meaningless life. Scrolling through TikTok is not a meaning, it's not a life well lived. So COVID gave people a, a sense of drive and purpose and meaning, and people were happy for that and went along with it for that reason. Yes. Um, and I also see a tendency when times of crisis hit, uh, whether it's real or imagined, uh, people who are you know, innately desirous of freedom would all too easily give up their freedoms in exchange for a, a value which they believe would meet their needs at that time. So, of course, uh, Mises, who has been through so many crises during that time, how was he able to, I guess, maintain his, I, I guess, freedom first um, outlook? Yeah, and his dedication. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, it, it's actually remarkable if you think about, you know, being driven out of his home in 1934 and, and working, in, you know, with very few colleagues and friends for six years alone in Geneva writing this thousand page book and then coming over to the U.S. without his books or papers and penniless without having spoken the language at the age of 60. I, I don't know how he, um, how he did it really it's he was a human being and he was uh sad sometimes and so in 1941 coming on the boat he wrote his memoirs of his life in europe and and he and he says in one really pensive passage he says i set out to be a reformer but i only became a historian of decline and that's a very sad remark and and it was true uh really and then uh it remained true um, all the way to his death in 1973, uh, but but he never stopped fighting. Um, he he says that as a young boy, he adopted um, a personal motto from the um, from Virgil, which is uh, never give in to evil, but just keep proceeding ever more boldly against it. And he said that that was his lifetime motto, motto, and and that's what he always did. I mean, people can say that, but 
Um, it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to actually do it. Mises actually did it. Uh, and uh, quite remarkably. And it cost him. It cost him financially. It cost him professionally. It cost him in terms of social status and otherwise. He was called terrible names all of his life. Terrible names. He never got a full position at University of Vienna. Never got a, a really legitimate full professorship at the New York University. And... Um, his greatness only started being recognized after his death in 1973. And even then, it took a very long time. Uh, so he made a lot of choices um, that were against his best professional interests. Um, and one of the things that makes me really angry is when you when you hear people say, and I've heard uh, friends and colleagues of, 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 uh, of him coming out of his later years, who said, oh, who would say to me, oh, Mises, he was his own worst enemy. You know, like, I, I don't know what that means, really. Um, if you mean in the sense that he didn't choose professional advancement and wealth over principle, that's really true. Um, but that doesn't make you um, your own worst enemy. It makes you the best friend of truth. And that's that's what he was. <laughs> Huh. Now that we know of his significance after his passing, uh, how would you make the case for um, the significance of Ludwig von Mises today? Well, he's one of the very few intellectuals, and really there are very few, um, in the course of the 20th century who consistently opposed a Bolshevist, the Bolshevik uh, communism, uh, soft socialism, of the sort that bankrupted uh, the UK, um, racialism and Nazism and 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 anti-Semitism of of Nazism. He was a, a a strong opponent of all forms of of fascism, and warned against the the end of the gold standard. Uh, so it's just like for a hundred years of writing, nearly or seventy years of writing, or sixty years of writing, I guess you would say. Um, he he was just really consistent in, in identifying all the errors of his time, uh, all of the errors of his time, and and warning uh, people against them. And and he he did this throughout his entire life. I mean, it's it's actually kind. Of, and you might say, "Oh, well, that's fine." Well, you know, I I can't. It's not obvious to me that there are many other intellectuals in the 20th century that can have, that can brag about having been right about everything. You know, I mean, that's just that's extremely unusual. It's it's very very unusual, very rare. So in that sense, I, he it really, in in terms of 20th century intellectual forces, he really rises uh, very near the very near the top, if not at least in my own mind, the top. Uh, in in terms of the social sciences, absolutely. Well, I think that's a very wonderful note to end on. Thank you very much, okay. Jeffrey Tucker, for okay. joining the show.